Welcome to Chapter 21 of Traditions and Encounters, Worlds Apart, the Americas and Oceania. So in these regions of the world, they were really isolated from all the stuff that was happening in Eurasia. So as a result, they developed some pretty distinct cultures as well. So the first thing is states and empires in Mesoamerica and North America. One of the first groups to occupy these areas that were really big were the Toltec and the Mexica. And the Toltecs emerged around the 9th and 10th centuries after the collapse of this big city-state known as Teotihuacan. Okay, rip my pronunciation. But basically what happened was they established large states and a powerful army. And through this, they were able to conquer many other places and establish their dominant empire. So they traded a lot, but they also retained close relations with other societies along the Gulf Coast where they resided, such as the Maya. Also, the Toltec declined after the 12th century. Part of the reason was there were civil issues as well as nomadic invaders after 1175. That is obviously a common trait we see between many empires around the world. Outside invaders come in and topple their empires. Later on, there was the arrival of the Mexico or more well known as the Aztecs. And these were people who lived in central Mexico during the mid 13th century. So these people, they were basically warriors and raiders and they built this capital city, Tenochtitlan. And this was basically modern Mexico city today in about 1345. And through this big city, they also developed productive agriculture to help feed the population there, and that was the Chinampas, so a very important thing, innovation to know there. By the 15th century, the Aztecs had launched military campaigns against neighboring societies, and they were really successful as they conquered and colonized other smaller regional empires such as the Oaxaca in southwestern Mexico. They also made alliances with others like the Texcoco, and they built an empire of around 12 million people, most of which were residing in Mesoamerica. So that's like modern day Mexico and Central America. So through this, they controlled subject peoples with oppressive tribute obligations. So people who were conquered had to pay this Aztec government. The empire had no bureaucracy or administration, but they did have local administrators which helped to enforce these tributes. Allies also did not have a standing Mexican army. Mexican society, so the social aspect of these civilizations. Most information we know about them comes from Spanish sources because, spoiler alert, the Spanish would later come in, destroy all these civilizations, and write their own version of history. You know, there's a famous saying that history is written by the winners, and this was no different. So we don't know a lot about them, but we do know that the warriors were the elite and they were at the top of the rigid social hierarchy. Mexico women had no public role as well, but they were honored as mothers of warriors. And these Mexico women, although they didn't have like a ton of freedom, they were revered because they were active in commerce and crafts, and their primary purpose was to bear children. In fact, different from all the other civilizations, women also di- women who also died in childbirth were celebrated as like doing a great cause for the civilization itself. Priests also had a dominant role. So they read almonds, presided over rituals, even monitored the ritual calendar. You may remember a few years ago in like 2012, the Inca calendar said the world was going to end. But basically, priests in the Americas had a big role. And these advisors, they were advisors to the Mexican rulers. And occasionally, they did rise to become the supreme rulers of these civilizations. However, most of the people in the Mexico were either cultivators or slaves, so they weren't really powerful. Cultivators worked on the Chinampas, as said earlier, and sometimes they even worked on the aristocrats' land. These people, they mostly paid tribute and provided compulsory labor service for public works, so that benefited them in some regard. Also, there was a large number of slaves who worked as domestic servants, so slavery had been in the Americas long before others were brought here. Artisans and merchants also enjoyed specific prestige. Artisans were valued for their skill work, especially luxury items at the time, which were rare because they didn't have all this trade with Eurasia going on. And trade could be profitable, but it was also risky because, of course, there were bandits along the way and there wasn't really an established trade network like the Silk Roads. Religion, the deities were adopted from prior Mesoamerican cultures. One was like Quetzalcoatl, which is like that bird god. 
Also, there was ritual bloodletting, and this was common to all Mesoamericans. Now, this is a big deal because no society really before had done this. Basically, they practiced human sacrifice. And at this large temple at the center of the city, there were thousands of skulls from all these dead people. So it was really brutal. People and societies of the north. So north of Mexico, in modern-day Southwest America, there were groups such as the Pueblo and Navajo, and some of them still exist today. They had agriculture and irrigation as well, and sooner or later, they even built stone and adobe buildings. Also, in the northeast of the United States, there were the Iroquois people. They were an agricultural society in the woodlands, and you'll learn more about these next year in U.S. history. Also, there were mountain building peoples in eastern North America. So these were people who built big earthen mounds for ceremonies and rituals and burials, and that was really what they were remembered for. The largest mound is in Cahokia, Illinois, so that's modern-day St. Louis. And you'll also learn more about that next year in U.S. history in the beginning. So that's where these two overlap. It's really interesting. For these civilizations, though, there were no written records, and so burial sites are really the only revelation of this existence of social classes and trade as we know it today. In the Andean South America, so we talked about the Mesoamericans, so if I were to draw a very bad map, like this is Mexico, right? And then this is Central America, and then there's South America right here. So as we talked about, the Mesoamericans, like Aztecs, were up here. And now the Incas were down here, the Andes Mountains, along the west western side of South America. And basically, these people, they were fairly similar, but they also had some differences. For one, they cultivated a primary crop of potatoes, and they also herded special livestock like llamas and alpacas, which weren't really available anywhere else. And they also traded with the lower valleys and chewed coca leaves. So this is kind of a fun fact. It's they chew these coca leaves, which is actually where cocaine comes from. So sometimes, you know, they were a bit high working in the fields. But they modeled their civilization primarily after this powerful kingdom in the lowlands of Peru before the mid 15th century, and that was called Chimu. And Chimu had these irrigation networks that cultivated lots of agriculture and had massive brick buildings. So this was really something for the Inca who came later on to follow. The Inca settled first around Lake Titicaca in the Andean Highlands. So the Andes Mountains runs along the spine of Western South America. And so that's really where they live. There was this famous ruler named Pachacuti who launched campaigns against neighbors in 1438. And through this, he was able to build a huge empire stretching 4,000 kilometers north to south. The Inca ruled as a military and administrative elite, and they used several things to help them rule more effectively. One was Quipu, which was a system of record keeping. Basically, it used knots to count certain things. So like if they had like three bushels of grain, they might tie three knots. Also, there was a capital at Cusco, so this was kind of like the Tenochtitlan equivalent, but in South America, and this had a ton of people as well. Another notable thing that they innovated with was an extensive road system, so like the first major one in the Americas, and this linked the north and south, so Persia wasn't the only one with these major roads. Also, there were official runners who carry messages on these roads, and that helped to spread their language, called the Quechua. Inca society and religion, so social again. They had limited trade, of course, because, of course, Andes Mountains hard to get through. They did have some local bartering and agricultural goods and fewer specialized crafts, though. And they had a hereditary aristocracy, and they believed that the ruler descended from the sun, so the sun was important to them. And after death, these rulers would become intermediaries with the gods, and it would sort of help to facilitate communication with the afterlife. Peasants as well, they worked the land and gave a portion of their produce to the state, sort of like taxes. And this revenue sometimes was used for famine relief, say if one year the crop didn't turn out real well. Also, peasants provided heavy labor for public works, so this benefited them as well, usually. And Inca priests, sometimes they served as gods too. As said before, they venerated the sun god. And sometimes they practiced ritual sacrifice, but most of the time... They didn't, so sometimes they had human sacrifices, especially in a time where they felt 
things were going really badly, they would sacrifice humans to their gods, but generally they were not like the Aztecs and they did not have frequent human sacrifice. So that's a big point not to confuse. Also, the Inca religion had a strong moral dimension of rewards and punishments, sort of like those in Mesopotamia. Oceania is the final region, and Oceania is basically just where Australia is and the islands in the Pacific. So in Australia, there were nomadic foragers, and these nomadic foraging societies did not really take up agriculture, they just moved around. They exchanged surplus foods and had seasonal migrations, and they had limited trade as well, of course, because they were separated. One group were the Aborigines. They developed a culture and religious traditions that are native and indigenous to Australia. Also, in the Pacific Islands, there were island groups such as Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji. And these distant islands became more isolated, especially in the eastern Pacific. And there were mariners in these areas too, but they took long voyages. Some settled in Easter Island, which is a really famous place. Also, some even went to the west coast of South America, where they were able to bring back sweet potato and transform their crops in Polynesia. Also, there were some in the Hawaiian Islands, so a little bit of modern-day America there. And population growth occurred on all the larger Pacific Islands, and this was primarily occurring because of diversified farming and fishing sort of to boost the nutritional value for these people. And as talked before earlier, Easter Island, that's known for their large stone head sculptures, they disappeared. The people there who migrated there just disappeared without a trace, most likely due to conflict and environmental degradation, and possibly from overpopulation as well. But we don't know because there are no records to tell us. That's a big mystery in Oceania, even to today. So in conclusion, this has been Chapter 21, Worlds Apart, the Americas and Oceania. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one.